to those sounds, because we're always going back to that connection between the sound and the letters. Good phonics instruction provides sufficient practice in reading words. Okay? We have to provide those multiple expo exposures. If your, child, if your child or any child who's struggling in reading, uh, my son Brady probably requires um, at least 30 exposures to a word for it to start to become automatic for him. So just providing that practice and providing that exposure um, as quickly as we can. We talked about distributed practice. I'm not going to you know, drill and kill him for, for, for an hour, hours on end, but um, at any moment I can, um, as well as in his school, enabling him to have the proficient practice in reading the words, isolated words, in sentences, um, looking at decodable text as well. It leads to automatic word recognition, um, and it is one part, um, one part of a comprehensive reading program. So all reading instruction, the goal of all reading instruction is to get to comprehension. Okay? It's not to understand what graphene needs to be used in a certain place in a word. But that is necessary for us to be able to get there. Because it frees up, when we think about that brain model again, it frees up cognitive resources so that the child can identify multiple meanings of the word and activate their previous knowledge uh, for a given word. So if you were here when we t um, did our acting out the brain activity and we had different sentences, we had uh, one word for the word train. Okay, so multiple meanings of the word train. What's the first meaning that you guys think of? A choo choo train, a locomotive, right? What else? Um, bridal dress, okay? Mostly female here, so. <laughs> Tolga, was that your first thought? <laughs> Um, yes, this is teach. So we have multiple definitions of the word depending on your own background experience. That's going to be primed to come up first. Um, but if I said the bride's dress billowed as she walked down the aisle, then you're going to know which meaning that targeted. Um, if you're still stuck on the chur, like it sounds like T R, like what does A I say, you're not going to get to what meaning of training is that going to be. And so you've, we've lost them on that four part process of those upper level processing systems. Um, I hope also that you understand from this last um, point, good phonics instruction incorporates phonemic awareness, it incorporates phonics, it incorporates connected text. All of these things have to come together. So you can't just come in and say, all right, I'm gonna do a phonics patch, I'm gonna do Wilson completely separate and distinct from anything else and think it's gonna do the job. It has to be a comprehensive system. Um, so um, I wanted to include um, uh, elements of explicit pho uh, phonics lesson sequence. Um, so I know TE is in, I think they've decided, right, about their new curriculum. Um, so I'm just making sure, in, you know, whatever school you are in, kind of trying to understand what does the instruction look like? Tell me what it looks like. When my child sits down, what are the minutes spent on? Um, so of course we want to include that time to develop phonemic awareness. Knowing that that 10 minutes a day is what um, research advises. Um, introducing sound and spelling. Um, so one of my favorite tools, um, that if I was more tech savvy, I'd be able to pull up on the screen, um, but it's only on apps. <laughs> um, but this is the OG card deck, um, so, uh, which is Orton Gillingham. Um, so you know, being able to uh, work with students. Um, okay, so it has we're going to drill the students just with those graphene units quickly at the beginning and then move on into how those um, blend into words. So if we have eat, how many sounds are in eat? If you have underneath your chair, I, um, you have phony um, graphene boxes or alconin boxes, okay? All right, so how many sounds are in the word eat? Let's tap it out. Eat. Okay, so um, in that <coughs> first box, what sound is it? E. e. How do we spell the sound E? E. E. A. Right, okay, and then T. That goes in our second box. How do we spell T? T. 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 Excellent, okay? So pulling that together, um, using tools like this, so we're mapping what letters and graphemes go into which box, um, building that automaticity. Okay, so thinking again how fluency is developed on the side, all of those components at once. Um, and then applying that to decodable text. 
Um, so there's also a lot of confusion about like what, what is decodable text versus what is leveled text, okay? Um, decodable text is really restricting the, um, the text to what uh, uh, patterns that are, the student has already been instructed in. So we can sort of give them a better success rate, but they're applying the skills and the rules and the patterns that we have already taught them on. Um, level text doesn't do that. Okay. The le readability uh, formulas for level text are really, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Not consistent. Not consistent. Thank you. Okay. Inconsistent. Thank you. Um, so it's really hard to, um, you know, ap apply that. Um, level text also doesn't tell me, if, you're, if you say to me, my, my child's on a level G versus a level F, that doesn't mean much for me as a teacher. I can't say... That, that doesn't help me from an instructor. Yeah. Also, that was level text. Like yes. So kids just yeah. Yes, exactly. And patterns, lots of patterns. Yeah. Like, you know, the boy is and then yeah. yeah. Repetitive. It's, it's predictable. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. Like exactly. The word city yeah. is in like a level E. Right. Text, yeah. which I think is crazy. Yes. Um, what is your favorite decodable text? Like, do you, there's so many out there. But some of them are kind of dry to read and like see that that. Like, yes. Do you have any favorite? Um, there, you know what, it's so great, out, I mean, years when I first started, the only things that were out there were, were produced by Wilson or OG. Um, so I, Cheatham has um, some wonderful simple words, um, it's a really wonderful tool um, that, that you've developed, so thank you. <laughs> um, but the nice thing is there's a lot, there's just a lot more options out there to increase the variability um, uh, like that. Um, uh, and then um, word work for decoding um, and encoding. Jackie, um, Jackie, there's one other series that I really like for yeah. okay. the Geode series. Yes, yeah, kind of G E O D E S. Um, it aligns with Wit and Wisdom, which is a really good curriculum if you're a teacher um, and you're looking for a content-rich curriculum. But th they have leveled readers that go with Foundation, oh, so perfect. and they're content like heavy, so they might be doing a dinosaur unit or something, and, and they're good, but they're kind of pricey. They are pricey, but um, but it's exciting for me is that we're going in this direction where everything's coming together and supporting one another, um, rather than having pieces of things um, yeah. disconnected. And then you can copy them and if you're ordering them from school, mm -hmm. it makes sense for me to spend money on something. Yeah, like right, use. right. Sorry to interrupt. Okay. No, thank you for interrupting. Um, so I also wanted to just kind of include um, what this would look like for instructional standpoint. I'm not going to go into all this, but I really wanted you to pay attention to like looking at the minutes. So we talked about <coughs> distributed practice. So short bursts, focusing on a task. My teachers are often completely overwhelmed when I tell them, okay, I need you to create a lesson plan with all of these things in it. And it's like, whoa, 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 like how am I supposed to do that? Okay, just coming up and thinking about short activities that are going to target the skill that you know you're going to do on a daily basis, and it's going. You're, those are going to yield the, the long term, um, long term benefits. Um, again, starting with review. We have to review the previously taught concepts on a regular basis to overlearn the concepts. If they're overlearned then they don't have to think about it. They're not spending cognitive resources on recalling those concepts. Um, developing those new letter sounds so that OG card deck, um, excuse me, um, any, uh, any uh, letter uh, graphing cards, um, excuse me, that you have uh, available to you, um, but following the scope and sequence um, of what is, um, uh, what the curriculum advises. Um, looking at a picture sort, um, so sorting pictures with a sound, um, a target sound to their matching letters. Okay, so in that, we're focusing on developing that phonemic awareness. Okay, um, and this is just for, um, I think this was a first grade level, early first grade level lesson plan, but really what I wanted you to pay attention was the sound, uh, the amount of time that we're spending. So word segmentation, segmenting words onto individual sounds and matching the letters word chains, um, reading a word slowly, segmenting those sounds, making, um, touching it, seeing it, changing it, um, moving on to a different sound. So we're doing a lot of different things that are targeting a lot of the same skills. So we're keeping the kids' attention, focusing on developing um, the same things. Uh, decodable text comprehension for five minutes, 
word reading and comprehension. I'm sorry, I don't have the minutes on there, but that was a 10 minutes and then closure, um, you know, another two minutes there. Um, this might be in addition to, it would certainly be in addition to a time where you're spent on developing, um, like uh, the teacher might do a guide, uh, a, a lesson of reading a book. Okay, um, so having that oral language exposure where we're at, um, exposing them to higher level vocabulary words, but they're not going to get that in the text that they're reading right now. <laughs> Versus, um, this is a lesson frame from uh, level of literacy instruction, which is a Fountas and Pinnell curriculum. Um, so uh, rereading books and assessment, we spend five minutes on that, phonics and word minute, five minutes. Writing about reading is 15 minutes. Looking at a new book is five minutes. Optional is that work work. Okay, so they just don't have the same emphasis on really developing the phonics skills, really, really emphasizing the overlearning of these early concepts in this early grade uh, grade levels. So we're really looking, targeting at K one and two with these types of um, activities. Um, okay. Let's talk about sight words. <laughs> um, so there's lots of definitions about sight words. So I guess before I put that up, what do you think of when we talk about sight words? Anybody? Words you can't sound out. Okay, words you can't sound out. Word. Tolga? A word you recognize immediately and say. Okay. Common words like the, said, that pop up a lot of time. Okay, good. Are all of those things the same? No. They're not the same, okay? It's really confusing when we say we're working on sight words, okay? I've started to move away from using that idea of sight words and starting to think about flash words, okay, which might match up to Tolga's definition, so words that, he, that a child knows automatically and reads as if he's speaking. Those would be flash words. Heart words, okay, which we'll talk about in a minute, might be words that they can't map, okay? So they cannot sound those out, um, so they have to remember part of it um, by heart. Does that make sense? Um, so when we're talking about sight words, and if your child is coming home with sight word decks, I would clarify with the teacher, what's the goal here? What's the purpose of this activity? Um, how are they supposed to be tackling these words? Um, are, uh, so these are the definitions that you guys sort of um, brought up, are reading a whole word, looking at the shape, and being able to recognize it. Okay, so when I was in teacher, my teacher education program, we were like diagramming the height of the, the letters, okay, and being uh, teaching kids to recognize that. Um, sight word is a irregular word, they can't be sounded out, or um, what Tolka <coughs> said, familiar written word, recognized instantly, automatically, and effortlessly without sounding it out or guessing, can be regular or re irregular, okay. But really, um, <coughs> moving towards the idea in the literature, Thinking about sight word vocabulary or simply sight vocabulary refers to the words the student knows instantly and automatically. So, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the Dolch list or the Fry lists. Um, so, these are the words, the most frequent words in the English language. Um, so, certainly, um, these are divvied out week by week in most kindergarten and first grade curriculums um, for kids to be drilled on. Yes, Tolkien? The problem is when they give these out, it's a mix of trick words and decodable words. Yep. The kid has no clue which way to use when they're doing it, so they lose confidence very quickly. I 100% agree with you. And, and what's so interesting is these, were, these lists have been automatically translated as words that we have to memorize. And if, if you were with us for the first session and talking about the reading brain and some of the really common strategies that we see in our kids' classrooms, like um, Skippy Frog or Picture Power or um, Guessing from Context, <coughs> this is what, when Tolga, when we send home decks of words that kids just have to remember, um, we're, we're encouraging guessing. And we don't want them to just memorize the whole words. When we dot, when we kind of dive into these words, if you can see the color differentiation there and the um, percentiles, um, a lot of these words um, can be broken down and, and to be decodable. We can break these words down this way. 
Um, now, we might want our students to be able to recognize some of these words before they're really ready in the, uh, in the systematic scope and sequence that we're teaching them. Um, so we're going to talk about ways to do that. Um, but anytime you could, you, your child comes to a word that they're unfamiliar with and that they need to sound out, I would always encourage them to sound out the parts that they know. And then highlight the parts that they don't know. And only give them that part. And then sound out the rest. Okay? Um, so the, for most that are not, I have to switch to a different screen here. Sorry, I had this pulled up and then my son was helping me. <laughs> Are there any questions? Um, Kate, do you want to come up and help me? Sure. I'm a Mac person. <laughs> <laughs> um, Is there any questions about, yes? Um, if your child is much older, teenager um, and there's they are compensating very well but someone from Bill said that they still end up underlying reading issues what do you do like if they're going to be too bored to do things that you know kids would do if they're a teenager already like if they it's a weakness that hasn't really you know, it's, it's been ignored yeah um oh thanks Kate um I mean, I, it, it, there's not like a one answer that I can say. Um, I worked with 16-year-olds um, that were have gone through time and time again of failure after failure after failure, um, and um, once they start seeing like the connection, um, are really empowered by that. Like, oh, this makes sense. I will tell you personally, um, I never had a problem reading. I had a really hard time spelling. I was the child on the floor kicking and screaming probably has led me to be where I am today. Mm -hmm. But I went, um, you know, did well in school, very well in school, um, was in, you know, junior year of college, and I got a job at Linda Moon Bell uh, learning processes. And um, in that, began to learn that there were rules about why we spell words a certain way, and when I could drop, drop, oh, drop the Y, and what do I have to change, and there was rules for all that. And I was like, how come nobody told me? <laughs> if somebody just told me there was a rule, I, I, I would have gotten past this a long time ago, rather than perceiving myself as just a poor speller. You know? So it was, it was an empowering moment for me. And I think for those kids, sometimes if they've gotten through school and they're performing at a level that's not catching them, right. they have some pretty strong compensatory skills like memorizing a whole lot of words. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah doing all of that using the pictures and like literally memorizing big words and when they have an, um, the ability to, to sit down with someone who they connect with number one right because when you're 16 it, it's about connection um, and and then they hear the, the, the phonemic awareness and, and, and they're doing those quick um, activities and they see progress mm -hmm. and they're like holy cow um, I haven't sounded out a word for most of my life right I mean I think and, and, I, and I do think in our community, we tend to see a lot of what we call compensators. Mm -hmm. And they slide by because they have rich background knowledge. They, they've had a lot of exposure to text and, and all sorts of things. So um, I have a 13-year-old who's turning 14 who can read um, because he was uh, had, had a lot of intervention. But we're struggling right now with writing. And, um, and that's where we often will see the breakdown. And, and that also has to be taught systematic and, mm -hmm. systematically and explicitly, but there's not as much out there ar around that. Um, but that's something as parents, you can start to look for that stuff. And sometimes I think um, getting this instruction around writing and not around reading can make them motivated because they don't feel like they're dummies who can't read, you know, like, which is kind oh, of, what, you know, um, so that's just another thing that they um, interesting that you brought up spelling. Would you say there's like a certain profile with, um, I've got, there's a lot of information, but if you could like generalize about a poor speller or a poor, like, do they fall into buckets? Like someone that's not a writer and what's their profile? Maybe not as strong in writing, but like not as strong in spelling. Exactly. There certainly are some profiles out there. The, the largest majority of anybody, anyone who's having any reading or spelling deficits, the, the deficit stems from the phonological level. It stems from that sound level. 
Um, so um, my last slide sort of talks about some of these older readers when we have, like if they're, are they performing on grade level, are they not, you know, and like breaking that down a little bit. Um, and I don't know the profile, the, the, the child that you're um, speaking of, but a lot of, like none of us are even keeled across the board, right, right. you know? So um, some of us might have really high strengths in some area and lower strengths in other area. Um, and that erodes your self-esteem some, some, a lot of the time. So um, if they're able to compensate, um, I think that still has a negative impact down the road, particularly in um, writing as an apex skill. It all breaks down in writing. Um, so whether it's like composing a sentence or the spelling, you know, similar, like we talk about the lower um, functions in the four-part processing system. If you can't spell a word, how on earth are you gonna choose a word? Um, or co construct a sentence that really perfectly articulates the idea of it. And as well as thinking about what text structure am I thinking about, what's the fact I have to convey, there's just so much more going on. There. So. Yeah? Do you think it's also because we grew up with the whole language approach? I mean, you didn't know the rules, I didn't know the rules, because no one, we didn't have this information back yep. then. And, you know, teenagers now also didn't grow up with that, so like they just might not have had that as their construction. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a instructional, pretty, instructional casualties. Instructional. <laughs> and then or it, it, just to have that be really meta, my you know undergraduates are coming out and, and they never learned this way. I and now know. I'm saying no, no, you have to teach this way. Um, mm -hmm. And it's it's mind better bender for them. Um, they're like I never thought it would be this hard. Most people think that if you know how to read, you can teach reading. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Told us that is the worst. <laughs> um, but yeah, so um, let's. Oh, just, I just have oh, one quick question yes. because um, I grew up and I'm, I, you know, I can read and all that kind of stuff, um, and I can tell if words are spelled incorrectly, but I can't recall the words. Mm -hmm. And I told us, I might think my son has the same thing, and he's he's above in math and above in all everything else, and he's been. I think struggling since that second grade from this. And we, we honestly, the school doesn't listen to us, so we don't know what to do with him. And so, I don't know yeah. if there's a program we can direct him towards. Because I, because um, a lot of it, you, you know, if I didn't have it, then I'd be like, oh, maybe he's a little lazy or something like that. Mm -hmm. But I actually know that, mm -hmm. that I have problem yeah, with hauling letters and stuff like that. Yeah. And I know that this is hereditary, so. Yeah, so uh, unfortunately, um, uh, we're in TE, it's a well-resourced district, um, and um, it's a, we have great teachers, yeah. um, and TE's not alone in this. Um, a lot of the districts are not using the assessments that they need to drill down to these foundational level skills to pick these things up. Um, and so your, your son, I think you said son, yeah. um, is able to compensate. And so he's able to do look like he's doing okay enough. Yeah, he picks easier words and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Exactly. And I, and, I know, and I know he has it because my younger son, who's eight, he's gifted in, in, in this particular area. So he spells better than my 12-year-old. Mm -hmm. And my 12-year-old freaks out because he yes. breaks his spelling. I have three boys, so I know that well. Yeah. <laughs> so, One of the things I hear when I, um, some parents are kind of like, oh, majority of, of kids aren't struggling with this, uh, with the reading decoding. So why should we, uh, why should everybody K-2 be getting the systematic explicit instruction? And I'm like, well, sometimes you're, we're not catching those kids. A lot of times you're not but catching also, yeah. Right, exactly. But also, it doesn't hurt anything because anything you do in the decoding, you do in the encoding and the spelling part, right. and it would make everybody a better and more effortless, uh, effortlessly uh, good speller, you know? Right. So, um, yeah, I mean, we know that this works for every child, right. so it's right. not holding back no. um, but that's, anybody. That's what I hear sometimes mm -hmm. from people who are We concerned. just need to reframe the message. Right. Yes. Right. Yeah. Um, um, I think for, for, in, for your, in your case, um, I think we'll have some tools to give you to kind of think through. Um, your son is probably now in middle school, yeah. so it gets a little bit tougher, but to give you the right questions to ask. Mm -hmm. And then there are resources um, in, in the defense of educators and districts everywhere. Um, there are only so many resources to go around. And until we get the core curriculum matching this, there are going to be kids who are compensating at a level that doesn't qualify them for help outside of the classroom. I know we had him tested for dyslexia, and he, he doesn't have it. But I know he has a form of it, like a very mild 
well, which yeah. can be debilitating because I know I can't. Right. No, and it's but there are resources, so you could, we can help you find resources outside of school that yeah. would be supportive and helpful in, in that okay. um, for sure. And Jackie has lots of resources that she shared in her previous session. There could be a whole, back, like, there, there could be a lot of different things that, you know, I mean, we're, we're all not the same profile, so it's, it's yeah. hard to put people into buckets for specific things. There's general, general generalities, for sure, um, but um, as Kate mentioned, the goal is to change the K-2 instruction so that we're catching all these kids, so just to kind of think about, like, um, when kids reach the age of nine, the um, structure of the brain starts to change and becomes less malleable, um, so it's less you know, less, um, it's harder to get changed. So it can take up to four times longer to remediate after the age of nine, which is when we have the highest referral rates um, into special education for reading. So um, kids are often not getting caught until that point when it's already up to four times harder to remediate. Um, so the goal is to screen these kids before they come into kindergarten so we can catch them before they fail and really strengthen that. Up. So, yes, I have a question. Yeah, for info, my boy, he probably were confused whether he need SAP or SAIP. So like out of like 20 spelling, he went to me when we get to a three right. So in the meantime, I still he's decoding his history. So I wasn't sure so I, because every single sentence is he read, and at least there is one word or something like this. Mm -hmm. He will be read something similar. Uh, so he'll read, he'll read the word said correctly, but he's not able to spell it. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, right. Yeah. right. Maybe he, he meant read he, instead of his, he probably will say said, S-A-B, rather than say. You want to say it, right? Yeah, so, yeah. Oh, okay. so this kind of, a, I'm confused to myself better, like, what does really exactly decoding mean? So yeah, like, a lot, like, most of the time people, I mean, will be stronger at reading or decoding than mm -hmm. they will be, like, encoding is we, that's like another layer up in terms of the complexity of it. So spelling those words is always going to be more difficult or challenging. That's why I like to use it as a teacher as, as like a diagnostic tool. So I love doing spelling analysis, um, which is a very, very nerdy, but um, it tells me a lot about how the, where the child is. I, I, okay. I suspect if you had a sentence where you spelled said S-I-A-D in it, and you put it all over that sentence, your son would read it and not recognize it because his brain is correcting it. Because his brain is correcting it, he's not a layer of the, the letters and the sounds so we can't replicate it. Um, it doesn't have volume. Do you need the volume? Can you do it? Um, sure. Maybe it'll work. Hold your ears, just in case. Okay. All right, that's okay. So saying the word said, mom said to take off your shoes. Okay, when we're thinking about the sounds in said, let's tap out the sounds in said. Said. Okay, so when we have our tools here, it's Eh, duh. We have three blocks there for three sounds. Okay, what says S? S. We know how to spell that, so let's make them write the letter S. Okay, what says D? D. They know how to spell that. That's that one to one correspondence, so we got that. Okay, this here in the middle part, that's something we have to remember by heart. Okay, so um, my Brady will touch his heart. Okay, A I is the F eh in said. Okay, so every time he's coming across this word, he's putting, he's drawing a heart around the AI. Okay, it's not automatic, it has multiple exposures, but it's telling him he has to use his tools to break this word down, to map what he can map, and then make an educated guess if he has to. If he has to. Okay, does that make sense? So these are the, those hard words, those irregular words, those words you can't sound out, um, that you need help from memorizing a specific part of that versus flash words, um, which are just words that are are decodable, but we just have to know really quickly, and we don't have to spend time on. Does that make sense to everybody? Does that mean it's 36% for words that yes. are predictable by rule with the most of, are yeah, usually most of our Most of the words, that the, this is what the, the tricky thing is, I didn't go into this um, for you guys, because it gets, you get into the weeds really um, easily. 
Um, but because we have different layers of language in, in English, the most um, uh, least stable um, and most complex spellings in our language come from the Anglo-Saxon layer of the English language. Um, and they are our most common words, or words for everything. Um, so, you know, um, earth, eta, e-a-r, um, all of those kind of these words for everyday objects and things um, all have that Anglo-Saxon layer. So that's why it's so tricky um, for the, a lot of those common words have um, that dip, those difficult spelling patterns. So. I don't know which one to do. Oh, not do. Just. <clears throat> I really dig into um, in um, developing our understanding of the orthography. Um, I expect my teachers to know um, the <coughs> language of origin of the word because that's going to have an indication for the spelling patterns. Um, phoneme graphene correspondence, that one to one correspondence, where a sound is given in a word. So we talked before about the, the, the ch sound at the beginning of a word, spelled with that ch. Okay, at the end of a word after a short vowel is going to be TCH. Somebody just tell me that and then I'll know, right? Um, same thing with the CK. Okay, so CK, K, and C, where do we spell the K sound? Let's give them rules for where they can expect to use those graphene patterns. Um, they can make sense about that. Um, letter order, um, sequence pattern, then orthographic conventions. So the letter B never ends a word in the English language. So if it's the last sound is mm, we have to add an E at the end, okay? So just providing kids with these rules um, makes, life, makes life a lot easier. Um, then um, getting into morphology, which is those meaning-based units, um, which has, you know, you think about like SAT words and breaking words down, um, all of our Greek and Latin uh, influence words, this really exponentially increases our, our kids' vocabulary power. Um, so including that in the instruction, and we're seeing even pushing that down earlier and earlier and earlier um, grade level wise. Um, it used to be not to start that till fourth grade. It's um, we're pushing it down into those lower grade levels. Um, so just looking at what we expect from phonics instruction and word recognition in K to two um, in kindergarten, we're expecting the knowledge of the phonemes and sounds and connecting that to the graphemes and spelling. So just that one to one correspondence. In first grade, um, understanding the knowledge of the sounds and spelling patterns, digraphs, so two letters make one sound, okay? Um, CK says the K sound, ch, is spelled CH. Our long vowel sounds, um, some endings in irregular spelling, um, decoding regularly spelled one syllable words and basic pattern two syllable words. Um, in our, th our second grade, um, expanding that, getting into those complex vowel teams, um, common, uh, regular, and irregular words, and then increasing the length, the, so the uh, two-syllable and common prefixes and suffixes, and those grade-level high-frequency words. Um, again, I sort of spoke to this earlier when I talked